Welcome to today's webinar on juvenile idiopathic arthritis. My name is Dr. Oral Alpan. I'm the director of the immunopathogenesis section at ONO Alpan LLC. Today's webinar is intended to be an overview for the primary care physicians and non-rheumatologists on the disease called juvenile idiopathic arthritis, also known as JIA. JIA is commonly misdiagnosed in children, and our goal today is to help you recognize some of the early warning signs of this disease. My aim for this presentation is also define and categorize JIA, review some of its symptoms, go over a couple of case studies with you, and also review the diagnosis and current treatment strategies for JIA. Slide 3 shows some of the key features of this disorder. It's a juvenile form of idiopathic arthritis. It's a chronic inflammatory condition with no defined cause in people less than 16 years of age. The disease commonly occurs in children from the ages of 7 to 12, but it may also occur in adolescents as old as 16, as well as in infants. Patients present with a variety of joint symptoms, such as pain, swelling, limited range of motion, redness of the joints, and synovial hypertrophy. One of the most concerning presentations of this disease is the presence of an inflammatory disorder in the eye called the anterior uveitis. There are different forms of JIA as shown in slide 4. It could involve a few joints called oligoarticular JIA or it could involve multiple joints called polyarticular JIA or it could be a part of a systemic onset disorder. And there are some more less common forms of JIA related to psoriasis, enthesitis, as well as a form called undifferentiated form of JIA. Slide shows various mechanistic features of this disorder. So far, the actual cause of JIA remains a mystery. Idiopathic refers to a condition with no defined cause. However, we do know that this disorder is autoimmune meaning that the body's own immune system starts to attack and destroy cells and tissues, particularly in the joints, for no apparent reason. It is believed that the immune system gets provoked by changes in the environment or a genetic mutation. Both antibody and T-cell related events lead to destruction of bone and cartilage, which becomes important when designing treatments that are geared towards the immune system. In slide 6, we can see some of the important epidemiological features of this disease. It's the most common form of arthritis in children and adolescents, estimated to affect approximately 1 in 1,000 children. There are reported sexual differences in the frequency depending on the type of JIA. Ratio of girls to boys in almost all forms, with the exception of systemic onset JIA, is higher. It is interesting to note, however, that JIA that is associated with uveitis presents at a ratio of 5 to 6.6 .6 girls to every one boy. And also, the form that presents secondary to psoriasis or enthesitis, the girl to boy ratio is reversed. Slide 7 shows some of the typical features of uveitis in JIA. On the right lower side of the slide, you can see some of the eye findings that would be characteristics for the presentation of this. It's an inflammatory condition of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid of the eye. It's a serious condition which could lead to blindness, requiring very regular eye exams and treatment. The uveitis is commonly seen in oligoarthritis form of JIA, but could be seen in other forms, especially with the psoriatic, or enthesitis associated JIA. Let's now go over some of the features of these individual forms of JIA. Slide 8 shows some of the features of oligoarticular JIA. It typically involves four or less joints. It's positive for ANA and occasionally for rheumatoid factor. Patients with oligoarticular JIA can have an abnormal CBC and SED rate values, and they have a very high potential of developing eye inflammation. Slide 9 shows some of the features of polyarticular JIA. By definition, it involves five or more joints, both small and large. It could be rheumatoid factor positive or negative. 
Generally, the joints that are affected are symmetric and it would involve joint erosions, especially in the rheumatoid factor positive patients. Systemic JIA involves inflammation of organs as well as the joint and it affects approximately 10 to 20 percent of all JIA patients. Its ratio in males and females are approximately equal. Symptoms may include fever, lymphadenopathy, serositis, transient rash, which generally occurs with the onset of the fever. Systemic JIA rarely affects the eyes. A polymorphism in macrophage migration inhibitory factor has been associated with this condition. Abnormal lab values include anemia, elevated white blood cell count, elevated platelets and ferritin, which could be secondary to a reactive process. Rheumatoid factor and ANA are regularly negative in patients with systemic JIA. In slide 11, you will see a case of JIA that's associated with psoriasis. The picture on the upper right side of the slide shows some of the typical features that involves swelling of the joints and some of the nail findings seen in psoriasis. It's interesting to see in this disorder that periods of remission of the skin condition is often associated with remissions of the arthritic symptoms. In enthesitis related JIA, the hallmark is inflammation of the sites where tendons attach to the bone. This condition may lead to spinal involvement with accompanying inflammatory spinal pain. And finally, slide 13 demonstrate the undifferentiated form of JIA where the symptoms of the disease do not fit one category or fits multiple categories of JIA. As you can see from these different forms, from a clinical perspective, JIA can be a very variable disease process based on the presentation. Slide 14 shows various current treatment strategies for this disorder. As you can see, the treatment can range from the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs all the way to B-cell depletion therapy using anti-CD20. Steroids, methotrexate, TNF inhibitors, anti-IL-1 therapy, and selective T-cell suppression therapies are various other modalities that one can consider based on the presentation and the severity of the disease. Let's now look at two case studies to give you a better feel of how to approach, diagnose, and treat this disorder. The first case is a 15-year-old female who presents with a four-month history of swollen fingers in both hands. She presents with reduced range of motion in her fingers in both hands. She reports difficulties writing and typing her schoolwork. She also reports significant fatigue. Her laboratory tests show a normal complete blood count, a normal CRP at 1 mg per liter, a normal SED rate, and Lyme titers. Her rheumatoid factor results are 1,760. When we look at some of the features that she presents with in slide 16, she has more than four joints involved. The joints that are involved are symmetric. She has a positive rheumatoid factor. She has a negative Lyme test and the CRP is within the normal range. Her diagnosis is polyarticular JIA. The treatment approach for this patient as first line would be the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and the second line treatment would be the use of methotrexate, steroids or TNF inhibitors and if these are unsuccessful the use of selective T-cell modulators such as abatacept could be an option. Let's now look at a different case study. In this case a five-year-old girl presents with a limp and a left knee. Her left knee shows synovial hypertrophy and she also has decreased range of motion. The laboratory values show that she has anonuclear antibodies but a negative rheumatoid factor. An eye exam reveals anterior uveitis. The diagnosis of this patient reveals less than four joints involved, no systemic features noted during the physical exam, and a negative lab result for rheumatoid factor. These findings are commonly seen in patients with oligoarticular JIA, as shown in slide 21. Slide 22 shows the treatment approach for such a patient. The first line therapy, again, like we saw in the polyarticular case, is the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
The second line therapy could involve steroid injection into the knee. And if these are unsuccessful, third line treatment would involve methotrexate. And the advanced line therapy would involve using TNF inhibitors. And one of the most important features is the referral of the patient to an ophthalmologist for the care of the uveitis. The prognosis of JIA could be very variable. This is a disease that may go into remission, and this is a disease, if not treated, may result in poor growth and worsening of joint function. Therefore, the prognosis depends on prompt recognition and treatment. The immune system can be modified with a variety of treatment regimens that I have described in the slide presentation. These will not impact on the progression of the underlying immunological dysfunction, however will prevent the destruction that might be secondary to the underlying immune activation. Thank you for listening this brief presentation of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. I hope this slide presentation gives you a good overview on the presentation of this disease, various diagnostic approaches you can take, as well as a guide in the treatment decision making. For more information, please con contact Oral Alpan at ONO Alpan in Fairfax, Virginia. Thank you.